Yeah. yeah? Right? Yes. Yeah. Deal? Boing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. There's a module for that? There, of course there is. This, this here, this is the... Acquia podcast and the Acquia podcast is when I get the chance to talk with interesting people doing interesting things in Drupal, in open source, in any place where that might touch it, be it PHP, be it politics and so on. And today I have someone with me. I'm really excited about this. Actually, it's an old Drupal friend of mine, but uh, you've never been on the podcast before, have you? Nope. First time. Thanks for having me. Why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Um, I'm Wim Leers. Um, Wim Leers, if you want to say it the English way. Um, and I've been in the Drupal community for slightly over nine years now, I think. So it's been, it's been quite some time. Whoa, nine years. What is your user number on Drupal.org? Uh, yeah, actually, I do still remember that because um, you type it or you see it quite often. So it's 99777, very easy one. 99777, that's also, a, in um, some places, probably considered a very lucky number. Um, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you know, Anglo-Saxon culture is quite obsessed with the number seven. And then yeah. in Asia, eights and nines are quite often auspicious. Uh. Anyway. So, <laughs> Wim, you work at the, or you work in the office of the CTO at Acquia. Yep. What's your job title? Uh, my job title, not that it really is that important, is senior software engineer. Um, but really, it's a, I'm working in the part of Octo that is working on Drupal Core, so improving the next version of Drupal Core and doing whatever um, is necessary to, for Drupal itself to move forward. So we helped out a lot with getting Drupal 8 out recently, for example. So you're being paid to contribute full-time, basically. Yes, yes. From time to time, I have to work on non-directly Drupal core things, but the vast majority of the time, yes. That's got to be a great job. I, um, I talk with a lot of people about contribution in, in, all, of its, in all of its aspects, uh, what, you know, the benefits that we get from sharing our code to how to you know, make your business better because you have the chance to invest in, in a much larger pool of, of, of developers and you know, all these different aspects. And One of the things that comes up is uh, though our software project Drupal is quite healthy right now, everyone has the feeling that companies can contribute more. How do you feel about, um, you know, how did, how did it feel when, when you got the chance to just be paid to contribute? Acquia pays uh, quite a few people just to work on Drupal. Yep. Um, yeah, so I, I felt um, honored. Um, and not not just towards Acquia, but just as as someone who's been in the Drupal community for a long time and who has been trying to contribute. But uh, of course, usually you have to um, do it in your spare time, and that's sometimes difficult to combine with studies, for example, or with work. Um, and so for, for me, it felt like um, like a great opportunity, but also something that you should not just look at. As, it, as if it's a regular, simple thing, like it's a regular job. To, to me, it feels like a, a bit of a duty towards the Drupal community as well, where you, you, you have to do your utmost best and you have to um, try to um, keep the balance in a way that you can not do while working on it in your spare time, in a sense that precisely because you have the opportunity to do it during the day and uh, you have to the chance to focus on it the entire time. You also have to um, try to resolve some things that you otherwise wouldn't like. For example, trying to uh, get a discussion that is going in circles for a long time, trying to move that in a consensus direction, that sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling very glad that I was given that ability to do that. Still happy to do it. So, yeah, I, I am very happy to be able to do that. Absolutely. <laughs> I guess that you also have the chance to focus on 
bigger, harder problems because you, yeah. you actually can devote all your energy to it. Yep. Yeah. So a big difference um, is that in your spare time, you usually have to um, look at a particular part of a bigger problem or look at smaller problems because the very biggest problems, they would take you months of evenings and weekends to move forward because some of the problems just take a lot of time and a lot of uh, work, a lot of refactoring or whatever it may be. And so those particular problems um, are indeed at this point quite often almost only solvable by people who are working on it full time precisely because you have to be able to work on that particular area for a long stretch of time in order to get it to completion. And otherwise, you're, you're going to leave it in a partially finished state, which would be far less than ideal. And so, yeah, I, I, I think most of us who have uh, the ability to contribute full time actually try to make sure that um, they help people who are doing it in their spare time, help those people push forward those more tricky problems um, uh, and try to support them along the way to help them get it to the finish line. Mm. Be, I think because many of us feel that obligation, like um, um, I do have that ability to review things um, more often than others. So let me help to try other people be successful in, in getting their stuff done. And it helps us all really. But um, I think that's it's it's a key difference. Um, that it, And that's also why it's very important that we have some people who are able to do it full time because otherwise some pe some problems would be extremely difficult to get resolved. Aha. Uh -huh. So so well thank you for all of your contribution because um, you've made a great difference in for example in the Drupal 8 release cycle and and we're going to be talking about uh, <clears throat> a couple of the hard problems that you've been tackling in the last couple of years. Um, and it feels a little bit funny to say it but you know thank you Acquia our employer <laughs> yeah. for yeah. for actually investing so massively in open source. You're not the only yep. person working full-time nope. on Drupal and, 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 and we've, you know, Acquia has done a lot, you know, really yep. put its um, money where its mouth is. There was the recent investment of a half a million dollars in Drupal 8 module upgrades, uh, which I'm also talking with a lot of people about. And I'm really, really excited about that. Let's change gears very, very slightly, keeping on the idea of contribution. Mm -hmm. We're in a very luxurious position, uh, yes. you and I, right now. A lot of companies, you know, smaller Drupal shops, for example, but but even corporations, um, for, for for various reasons, they don't get contribution, or or some of our colleagues would like to contribute more, but they um, have trouble finding ways to do that while paying the bills, for example. What's your overall feeling on on uh, companies that use open source and and whether they have an obligation or not to be contributing and how they might do that? Hmm. Yeah, that's a it's a tricky subject. Um, I, I I do think that there are some cases where it doesn't make sense for companies to contribute back in in very significant ways. If if it's just a too small company, I think it it will only start to make sense to contribute in a significant way once you have a few people, because then, um, like if if it's just you and maybe one other person, that's going to be very difficult. But as soon as you grow to a slightly bigger size, even if if it's just like Five people, maybe. Um, there are there are different steps, if you will, different levels of contributing. Um, and one level that is, I think, the most approachable, the most doable for even maybe companies of a very small size, like one two people, um, is to just whenever you use a contribute module and you find a bug, you actually report that bug in an issue. And if you have a workaround you actually post that workaround in the form of a patch to that module's issue queue. And so even those contributions, which are not enormous, but they do help a lot of people because it, it helps other people who have the same or similar problems find your report so they don't have to go through the same process. And if you have posted a patch, another person can verify that that actually works. And so then it can be committed. And then the next version of that module will actually contain it. So that's a very minor way of contributing, but it's extremely valuable because it saves a lot of people a lot of time over longer periods of time. Uh, uh, but then, go ahead. I was going to say, I think that um, it, it's, you say it's a small contribution, but the, you know, looking at the, long, the, the idea of the long tail, for example, uh, yep. the small contributions add up very, very, very yep. quickly. And, and honestly, exactly. 
if you find a bug and find a workaround and all you do is describe both of those very well or even just yes. the problem and you yes. describe it very well and you put it back in the module issue queue or, or where the appropriate place to report it is, GitHub, what have you, that gives the module maintainer, the developer of the project, the chance to go and fix that or someone else who has more time, you know, yep. Wim Lears in Octo or what have you, now we know about it for sure. It's a known problem and we can actually attack it and, and things will move forward anyway. Yep, exactly. Um, and yeah, so I, I describe it as being a smaller, but it can also be a very big contribution if it's a more complex problem and so on. But I, by smaller, I mean even if it's just a small bug, a small annoyance. And often you will think, well, it's not really worth reporting this because of the little, it's, it's a lot of effort or a lot of hassle for, for just a small bug, but it really helps. So even the small things, please report them. Yeah. Um, and yes, many hands make light work, I think is the English saying as well. Oh, and it's it's yes. so def definitely true. So I was, I was going to quote, uh, I was going to quote a German saying, um, which, which effectively means the same thing, but in a much more biological way. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, that sounds uh, fascinating. <laughs> it, uh, in German, it's roughly, uh, even small farm animals make gigantic piles of manure. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I didn't know with that one. Right, okay. well, I mean, Germans are very pragmatic, so. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm kind of disappointed we don't have the same thing in Dutch now. So the Dutch one is exactly the same as the English one. Oh, okay. So. Oh, damn it. Stupid Dutch. <laughs> um, but one of, my, one of my proudest moments, honestly, in the last couple of years was when my kids were at the code sprints at DrupalCon Amsterdam, mm -hmm. and um, my daughter was setting up a Drupal 8 site, and she was being helped by Brian Gilbert and by Ruben Tejero and a couple other people along the way. And she was trying to do something, and there was a problem, and she couldn't get her head around it, and she couldn't get her head around it. And so she asked Brian, and she's like, Brian's like, oh, Victoria, this is an actual bug. You know, yep. you discovered a bug in Drupal 8, and awesome. so they made her a Drupal.org account. She's Drupal, <laughs> Drupal princess, by the way. Awesome. And yeah, <laughs> so inspired by, inspired, inspired by Morton, of course. She, of she's course. A, she's a big fan of Morton. So Drupal princess. Um, <laughs> so Brian helped her set up that account. They filed the bug report. He wrote a patch. <coughs> and, I, and I think, or Ruben wrote a patch and Brian reviewed it. And so, and my daughter has a commit credit in Drupal 8 because- Awesome. Right? So she, and she was yeah. 16 at the time. And so, I mean, at least my family got one in because I didn't get one. <laughs> 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 but, um, you know, thinking about this idea of even the smallest little yes. things can make a difference. I was like, ah, oh, my kid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that's awesome. That's really awesome. And every time I get a bug report, and it's a well-written bug report. I'm, I'm um, positively, honestly happy. Mm. I'm happy that I get a good bug report because it makes it so much easier to find and reproduce that exact same problem and then fix it. Whereas if you're, if you're writing a one-line thing that just basically says, this doesn't work, yeah, that, that's very tough to figure out. So yes, just describing the problem well, the steps to get there, it's, it's very valuable. Yeah, absolutely. Nine years ago, Cast your mind back. Uh -huh. uh, how did you discover Drupal? Um, so I was I was going to build this website, and um, or I needed to build a website, but I was looking for a way that would allow me to set up a website that was maintainable, uh, that didn't require too much digging around in code, um, and that looked like it would be a good choice for the long run. Um, and I looked at WordPress, at Joomla at Drupal and I think a few others maybe. Um, but yeah, Drupal stood above the rest. Uh, very, like it was the obvious better choice back then at least. I was looking, there was a time of Drupal 5 being in, in beta. Um, right. So 4.7 was I think the, the active version. I never used that. I, I jumped straight to the beta because it looked uh, much better. Oh, I had the joy of installing 4.6 and 4.7. <laughs> the good old days. Wow. Yep. Drupal 5, Drupal, and Drupal 5 was such a massive leap at yes. the time. So yes. great. Oh, so you, you thought it was a good choice. Um, yep. Clearly, you were wrong. What are you doing these days? No. So <laughs> why, did, 
What, why did you stick with it now um, for, for nine years? Um, so yeah, I, I got kind of rolled deeper into the community, <laughs> as I think is the story for many of us. Um, so that was 2006, the end of 2006. It was uh, the Christmas break at my first year of university. And I was trying to actually do less work on this open source project that I, I was working on before by building a website so that others could maintain it. So it's kind of funny that I used Drupal for another open source project. In doing so, I needed a few things um, to, build, to be built myself in order for this website to really function well. And so I started working on that. And then I noticed and back then it was very easy to get a, an account that allows you to create a project, a module on Drupal.org. Right now, you have to go through um, a, a quite tough review process or Back then, at least, there was no review process. It was just if they saw you on IRC quite a few times, yeah, sure, you can get an account. Well, I mean, the pendulum swings back and forth on that one, and we've been in, I know. A, we, we've been in a fairly draconian uh, period <laughs> recently. Yeah, I, I don't know the details. In any case, back then, it was very easy. That's all that matters. Um, and so I, that's why I managed to publish a module very early on. Um, and uh, that started to be... Getting that started to get quite a few users and get more users, and I was I find it interesting that my that my module that was growing in feature sets and uh, getting more and more users and the hundreds of websites using it that was so fascinating to me that I I kept working on it and improving it more. Then I got freelance work doing that in the summer. So instead of having a crappy student job in the summer, I managed to do freelance work while further developing this module, um, and so. That led to more freelance development, and that led to my bachelor thesis being about um, about Drupal and CDNs and so performance in general. Oh. That then a few years later led to my master thesis being about Drupal, not not very strictly Drupal, but again performance, performance plus data mining to better understand why a site is slow in certain scenarios. Um, and so yeah, that that basically led to Drupal being a significant part of or significant presence during my entire um, period of studying computer science. So, What was that first module? Uh, hierarchical select. Hierarchical select. Yeah, so that allows you to select, uh, for example, a taxonomy term in a tree. So um, basically, very often you use uh, not a flat taxonomy where you have tags, which is called a phloxonomy very often, but instead, you can have taxonomies, vocabularies with terms arranged in a hierarchy. Um, and so, for example, you have make, model, um, car, or what is, it, what is a typical term? Uh, in any case, you have those kinds of um, very strict hierarchies where it totally makes sense to have a hierarchy, but then it becomes very painful to find the right thing in the hierarchy mm -hmm. in the tree. And that's where hierarchical select comes in. It makes it much easier. You select the top level thing, then something slides out with the second thing, then something slides out for the third level. Oh, and okay. The fourth level. I've I've used that even. I got it now. <laughs> and it's interesting because I think um, looking back over over, <clears throat> frankly, the last decade, taxonomies mm -hmm. were a killer app. Um, for a long period of Drupal's history. I'm not sure that they're considered that anymore, but the ability to make complex hierarchies and then do stuff with them, mm -hmm. um, for example, with Drupal's other killer app, which is, which is Views, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, was, was those, those two things gave us such an interesting technological yep. edge for a long time. My personal, I think the number one killer app in Drupal is actually our people. I think the community is amazing and you know, it's the, the, the smart people solving hard problems together is, is I think the actual, you know, we like yes. each other well enough to do that. I think yes. that's the actual yeah. differentiator. And, and yeah, the, the people working together while working on different use cases and from different perspectives usually leads to much better code that works in far more scenarios than the one narrow scenario that you were originally building for. And again, many hands make light work because many use cases covered, many people interested in the same sort of general solution. So that makes it so that it's much easier to build something that lasts a long time and that works well, even when translated, even when whatever special case that very many people don't need to worry about usually, but again, many people together. Right. Something. Fantastic. So, so <clears throat> picking up at your master's thesis, mm -hmm. um, talk about your work in performance and where that's led you. Yeah, so um, the, it's, it's quite interesting 
to see how Drupal led me to do a bachelor thesis on Drupal plus CDN to make Drupal faster. And then I, I wanted to better understand in which scenarios uh, a site could still be slow. So for example, when accessed from a certain region, even while using a CDN or when using a particular browser, or maybe a particular piece of JavaScript was slow in a particular browser, like those kinds of things, figuring that out is quite difficult. People complain it's slow, but they don't really explain why. Um, or it's, 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 it's normal that regular end users, if you will, non-technical people, will just complain and say it's broken or slow, but will not be able to pinpoint that's the, the exact reason. And so I worked and for there are, and thesis. There are, and there are, so, there are so many reasons that... that uh, yes. Yes, it can be so many reasons, and it can be very difficult to simulate that, to actually see it happen in front of you as a developer. And so for my master thesis, I, I, I worked on data mining uh, and collecting performance information, performance data. And so applying data mining on the performance data allowed me to automatically figure out which situations, which combinations were slow. And so then it would allow you to see which exact scenarios uh, are also the things that are most commonly slow. So therefore are most worth uh, attention from a person fixing them to, to look into those problems. Oh. And so from that point of view, and I, I published that master thesis and, and a series of blog posts about that. And somehow uh, a person at Facebook discovered that or, or uh, stumbled upon that, um, and he reached out to me. Um, he was uh, from the what it was called back then the site speed team, um, and I first I, I literally didn't believe it <laughs> that there was a person from Facebook contacting me. I, I was looking at the email headers to figure out <laughs> if it was uh, spoofed or something. Somebody's oh, pranking I'm, you, bro. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. That's what I thought. Um, so yeah, it looked like it checked out. So I was saying, okay, let's uh, let's send a reply, I guess. And then uh, two days later, I think I had a an informal Skype call with that person, and it looked indeed like there were Facebook offices or some <laughs> something in Silicon Valley like in oh, the in you, his background. You can tell because you could tell. <laughs> well, it, it looked like he at least wasn't in a cellar somewhere pranking me. So it, it was somewhat legit looking. Um, but yeah, then I, I had phone interviews, uh, and uh, I, was, I think I actually was asked in the beginning even to do a full-time position, but I was still studying. So I asked if it was possible to do an internship instead, and so I, that's how I ended up doing an internship there while continuing to work on that same data mining on performance data project, piece of software that I started for my master thesis. Mm. So it led me to an interesting place. So from, from doing something open sourcey to choosing Drupal because it seemed the best, to then getting annoyed by sites being slow and then looking at how Drupal could be faster for my bachelor thesis, to then better understanding it through my master thesis and at Facebook. And then uh, eventually I now ended up at Acquia. So it's a, it's a path that has definitely been big, hugely influenced by Drupal. Fantastic. So your, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but your biggest contribution to Drupal 8 has also been in the performance area. And would you like to talk about caching and cache tags and um, big pipe? Sure. So yeah, I, the, the, I've now been working on Drupal and working at Acquia full time uh, for about three and a half years, close to four. Um, the first part of that was Spark, so authoring experience. So that's a wizzy way getting CK. Um, the toolbar to a, to some extent, uh, those oh, so kinds of things. In, you came in during the, the Spark initiative period. Yes. yes, so that was 2012. And then uh, for the last one and a half to two years probably, um, I've been working pretty much entirely on performance, so making Drupal faster. And uh, a big portion of, of what was looking to be um, a good candidate for making Drupal 8 significantly faster was cache tags. That was a concept that was added a long time ago, I think even in 2011 or so, but it wasn't really being used in many places. It was only being used in a handful of places uh, across Drupal core. For example, entities, so nodes, terms, users, did not use them at all, even though they, they seemed like a prime candidate. Hmm. Um, and at the same time, we had the concept of render caching, which is a Basically, when rendering something, render caching allows you to cache uh, the fragment of the page that is being rendered so that you don't have to do all of the work of getting the data and then turning that into HTML via the theme system and so on, which can take some time. 
Yeah. Um, so the, the point was to use render caching in more places, the most expensive places, for example, rendering entities such as nodes and users. Um, and that actually made for an interesting overlap between render caching and cache tags, because when you have rendered something, you want that data to be updated as soon as the data it depends upon is changed. So for example, if you change the node title, you want the render right. cached nodes to be updated. Otherwise, so, you're looking at the old thing. Right. Now, I think that just about everyone who's listening to this will know this already, but what you're actually describing is, is one of the harder problems in computer science. How do you cache something and how do you yep. find out in a cheap way when that cache should be cleared and you have new data and how do you avoid having stale stuff showing up as much as possible? Yep. Yeah. So the, the, the saying in computer science goes that uh, there's two hard problems in computer science, naming things and uh, caching uh, or cache invalidation, I should say. Um, so to be clear, I did not invent cache tags. So that was something um, that very smart people came up a long time before me. I just uh, worked, I had the ability also, because I'm working on Drupal Core full time, to bring cache tags to many places in Drupal Core, and so that it's an, in, an inherent part almost of, of many parts of Drupal Core. And so I made sure that, for example, every single entity, entity type, um, so whether it's config entities or nodes or terms, anything, it has proper test coverage. And whenever those things change, the corresponding cache tag is invalidated which then allows me or allows us to have those render caches and any other cache to be updated automatically, to be invalidated automatically. So indeed, it's just a small bit of metadata that is associated with whatever is cached, whether it's rendered or computed or whatever it is. And uh, that allows us to very efficiently update those things. Um, and so cache tags everywhere make sure that we can reliably invalidate things and reliably have things update when they should, which was an impossible problem to solve in Drupal 7 and before, because and, we didn't have such a concept. And per performantly as well, if yes. that's a word. Yeah, yeah that's um, a word, with, yes. Without, without huge cost to, on my server. Yes. Yeah, there is always some cost, because there is something additional that needs to happen. You have to retrieve something from the cache, and then check if the cache tags that are associated with it have been invalidated in the meantime. Mm. That's the additional cost. But it's a it's a pretty small cost. That's Very that's small. that's a that's a much smaller cost than re-rendering the entire page. Yeah, every single time, which is what exactly. happened in Drupal seven and before. And actually, to be honest, in most other systems or right. uh, so most other CMSs and frameworks, or what you quite often see is that the solution, which is not really a solution, is to just assume it's okay to cache something for five or for ten minutes. But that means that if you, as a, as a blogger, for example, and you fix a typo, your broken title, your wrong title with still that typo in there is going to be there for another five to 10 minutes. So your changes are not showing up right away, which is a very annoying, disconcerting experience. Sure, it's a, it's a kludge. It's a, it's, a, yes. it's, it's a hack. Just, I mean, yes. you know, cron versus poor man's cron comes to mind as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a... Yeah. Yeah. So... Yep. so I'm going to uh, embed two recent webinar videos that you've done on this podcast page. So if you're, if anyone who's listening to the podcast, Wim, uh, recently and in real time, we're speaking in early 2016, Wim recently did two webinars uh, at Acquia about a thing called Big Pipe. And Big yep. Pipe is essentially the, the next step in this conversation. So I'm going to embed those videos and uh, WIM slides are also going to be available and I'm going to link to all the stuff that we're talking about. So we've got this fantastic caching architecture and in place and working in Drupal 8. Mm -hmm. what, what is BigPipe? And tell us yeah. about the magic that it does with all of this stuff. Yeah, so first off, um, actually the two webinars you, you were mentioning, um, the first one is actually a subset of the second one. So I would recommend to only link to the second one, which concludes everything. Um, so then people have one coherent story. So that's probably going to be oh. useful to them. So everything I just said before, <laughs> I, I will probably put them both up. But then with the proviso, if you want the, yeah. the full story in one go, the, I will yeah. clearly mark that one. Yeah, the first one is just the intro. The second one is, is the same information plus much more. OK, so um, first, is, first is high level. The second one is in depth. Yeah, basically. All right. Okay. 
Yeah, um, big pipe. Yes. Um, and so, so far we talked about cache tags and render caching. But cache tags are not the only bit of cacheability metadata that we have in, in Drupal 8. We have, we have two more. And those three, those three things together actually allow us to know comprehensively and with complete certainty what things it depends on, what it varies by, and so on. So cache tags are for declaring dependencies on data, for example, on entities, so that we know when something has changed. But we also have cache contexts, which allow us to define which context something depends on, so what it varies by, for example, if, uh, if Jam has user role A and I have user role B and we get different, uh, we have di access to different things, mm -hmm. then the outputs, the rendered HTML should also be different. Or maybe it says, hi, Jam, or hi, Wim, then the output needs to vary by user. And so those kinds of variations are what cache contexts are about. Um, so cache tags and contexts, and then there is a third called maxH. So to describe something that expires after a certain period of time, that's Less commonly necessary, um, max h zero means that something is absolutely not cacheable, so it needs to be requested or updated every second, every single time. Um, but it's useful for things like maybe temperature data that is okay to cache for, uh, that remains the same across, say, one minute or two minutes or ten minutes. Um, but so those three things together allow us then to know the dynamicness of every part of the page. And in Drupal, usually we have blocks. Uh, most people build uh, Drupal sites using the block system. Um, and so when blocks are appearing in different parts of the page, very often some blocks are personalized. For example, the menu block will only show menu links that are accessible to the current user. Um, maybe there is a shopping cart. Maybe there is a, hi, Jam, your friends have just sent you so many messages, something right. like that. And so those kinds of things are dynamic. But then usually there's also parts of the page, and it's not limited to, the, to blocks, by the way, but that's just a, an easy way to think about it. Um, and so usually you have blocks that are the same across users and usually even across everything. So for example, a, a menu in the footer or a search form, uh, like a search block. Or, or the main uh, content. The main content, yes. And so um, all of those are actually cacheable across users. Like if it's rendered once, we can reuse it for a gem, for me, for anybody else. And so thanks to those cacheability metadata, thanks to that cacheability metadata, so tags, context, and max age, we know that a given block is going to vary that much, is going to be stale at that point when certain entities are valid. For example, when gem changes his username into something like a llama, and just <laughs> give an example. Um, just to pick a random word. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, and so the fact that we know for any given block what things it depends on makes us able to know when something is very dynamic and when it's not. And so that allows us to pull out that part of the page, delay rendering it, so that we can send the entire page minus the personalized parts first, and then send the personalized parts, like the high jam block, the shopping carts, those kinds of things, we can send those later. And so the difference then is uh, the perceived performance, how, how fast the site feels, how fast the site looks, and actually just how fast the site shows up. So it makes it so that the site shows up instantaneously, regardless of user, regardless of, of uh, the complexity of those dynamic parts of the page, because the parts that are the same, which is usually significant parts of a page, those show up immediately. They can be sent right away, extremely that, fast, which actually, means that usually when I'm browsing, that's the stuff that I actually care about. That's the article yes. I want to read. That's the photo I want to yes. see because that every yeah. that's the point of the page, and that's what everybody's getting already. And yep. that's that's uh, usually pre-cached, ready to go, and and yep, exactly, barely, bare, barely or not at all dynamic. Yep, exactly. So the, basically, the crucial parts of the page. Uh, are usually not personalized. And in that case, we can make that available so, so much faster. Because Drupal and just about every other system out there, what they do currently is they render everything. And only then, once every single detail is rendered, then they send it to the end user. And that makes it so that you have to wait even for the stupid smaller things that are maybe not that important to you. Yeah. With BigPipe, which is then because of that metadata, it's just a module you can install. You don't have to configure anything. It, thanks to that metadata, they can figure out which parts are too dynamic or are very dynamic or personalized, can delay the rendering of that, send the 
majority of the page first and then send the dynamic parts later. And that makes for a much, much faster experience. And so we're trying to get that into Drupal 8.1. Um, and uh, it looks like many people are, are uh, happy with that. Um, it will not be enabled by default. It will even be marked as an experimental module at first because we want to make sure that it works in even the most uh, extreme cases. Um, mm. So it, it's better to first have it experimental so sites can opt into it and uh, can so we can get more experience. And then hopefully in A2, we can uh, make it a non-experimental module. Um, so, and so that will be a great performance boost with no effort, basically. So, so every cache site. tags, rendering, cache context, all of that is mm -hmm. in Drupal 8 and on always yes. by default. And I don't have to think about it. I'm just benefiting from your work. Yes. As, yes. Of, as of the beginning of February 2016, <laughs> if I want to take advantage of this delivery mechanism, which builds on mm -hmm. the techniques that's called the big pipe module yep and as of drupal 8.1 or 2 or probably you're moving that into core as well yep yep wow it's um, exciting yes it is very exciting and actually the irony once uh that this is actually a technique not invented by us i should say by the way that uh it was not just me who worked on this fabian franz uh also from germany by the way thank uh, you fabian and yeah, thank you, Fabian. Um, he did a great amount of work. He did the initial pioneering, the initial proof of concept. Uh, I, I worked a lot with him to, to actually make it uh, happen and, and get it to a, a more final state, but he did a lot of the work. But yeah. even Fabian didn't invent uh, this. It's a technique pioneered by, um, by Facebook. They uh, per they invented or, or published about this uh, some years ago. I forget. No, 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 no. When you were an intern there, no, you no, no, the no, documentation no. and you snuck it onto a photocopier and smuggled it out. Then I probably would be in trouble if that was the case. <laughs> no, Wimbledon's so master software spy. <laughs> That's actually a pretty cool title. I should <laughs> I should try to get that happen. Um, so yeah, they they pioneered it, and the, the whole point is that. Currently, or in the classical way of delivering web pages, what happens is first you do a request, then the server does work. You wait, you wait, you wait. You have a blank screen you're looking at. And then the server sends a bunch of things. And then the client, the browser, has to fetch all the CSS, the JavaScript, the images, and can only then start rendering. So it's a sequential process. And BigPipe allows us to, to make that a more parallel process, where the, the browser immediately gets a response, not with everything, but with probably the majority, if not all, of the CSS and JavaScript and images. So it can start downloading and rendering that already, and then dynamic parts show up. And so mm. that's, that's the reason it's called big pipe, it, in the sense that it becomes a bigger pipe along which to send things, because mm. things are happening in parallel instead of in sequence. All right. Wim, this is so interesting. I've been... Uh... I wrote a small post about this, and and you know I, I did some research into this, and every new thing I find out about it, it's just so exciting. It's such a great bit of technology. So um, thank you, Fabian from Taiwan Consulting for all of your work, Fabian Franz. Thank you, Wim, for your amazing work on this. I'm going to link to everything that we've been talking about, and I'm going to embed the webinar videos where people can learn a lot more about the technical nitty gritty of all this. Yep. And um, Wim, what's what? I guess I guess you're working on getting this into core now, right? That's pretty much yep. your job right now. Uh, no, I'm working on other things as well, but uh, that is uh, that is one of the the things that I'm going to focus on in the next few weeks. Yes, fantastic. So, yeah, I'm I'm very happy. It, it, I wanted to get this into Drupal ever since I read about it on Facebook's engineering blog, and so it's finally finally to the point where it already works. You can download it for 8.0 if you're running Drupal 8 already. It'll hopefully be in 8.1. And so it, it's, it's great that open source is unable to get this awesome technique, which doesn't require any infrastructure, which usually is the case for, for making things fast. You usually need a lot of infrastructure and money and servers. Ah, this that's you don't. Point. Yes. So it, it's something, it's just an effic more efficient way of delivering HTML and getting the browsers to render okay. stuff. And so I'm very excited that it's going to be available in an open source project like Drupal. And as far as I know, nothing else has something like this. So pretty cool. So I'm, work, I'm working through the, 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 the title for this podcast in my mind, and it's, it's got to be something like, <laughs> um, you know, 
bigger, better performance for free, right? This, the, the, actually, the point that, that you only just touched on now that, that, that I yep. hadn't thought of this morning, of course, was you don't need massive parallel server um, you yep. know, infrastructure and all this stuff to get things really, really cracking. In, in this case, yep. you get a ton more bang for your buck out of Drupal now, just with the, the all of this yep. default stuff. That's yep, because happening. usually people measure things in terms of requests per second. That is actually going to be identical with BigPipe. The, the, the entire duration of a request is going to be the same. It's just that we send useful information much earlier and then continue to send additional things, the dynamic parts, later. And so right. if you look at those traditional things to measure, which are easy to measure, but don't actually give you a good idea of how fast a site is, because what matters in the end is not the number of requests, but how fast it actually feels for the end user because that's what you care about. Yeah. And that's where Big Pipe makes a huge difference. Woo. Wim, thank you for taking the time to talk with me this morning. It's been so great. It's so interesting. And um, thanks You're for everything welcome. that you've been doing. It's, it's great. And, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, maybe see you next time and have a great day. <laughs> <laughs>